A ruler once came to Jesus by night to ask Have you ever heard that Jesus never claimed to be the Son of God? Where do the objectors get that idea? How can we answer that objection? Or is there a more important question to ask? Ye must be born again, again, ye must be born again, again, I verily, verily say unto thee, ye must be born again, again. Welcome to the Bible Study Pal podcast. My name is Greg Circle, the preacher for the Church of Christ that meets in Palmyra, Indiana. On today's episode of the podcast, we begin our in-depth study of the book of Mark. The purpose of this study is to prepare for our Book of the Month series in January of 2023, where we focus on the gospel according to Mark. Must be born again, again. I verily, verily say unto thee, Ye must be born again. Let's get into the study. Mark 1, verse 1, the beginning of the gospel. Thankfully, technology allows us to search the data of the scriptures with so much ease. If you do a search for verses that have all the words Son of God, not the search for the exact phrase because you'll miss a couple of instances, but if you search for all of the words Son of God, you'll find that in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus never says, quote, I am the Son of God, unquote. In John's account, however, he at least gives the implication in verses like John chapter 3 and verse 18, if indeed Jesus is the one who's speaking there, it is possible that starting in verse 16, John is giving his commentary on what Jesus has just said to Nicodemus. There's also the implication in John chapter 5 and verse 25, which we will get to momentarily. And in John chapter 10 and verse 36, Jesus does recognize that the accusation of blasphemy leveled against him by the Sanhedrin was brought on because, quote, I said, I am the Son of God. Also, in John chapter 11, verse 4, Jesus tells his disciples when speaking about the death of Lazarus, he says, quote, This sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. And he then raises Lazarus from the dead. And there's one more answer to the objection. Mark chapter 14, and verse 62, which we'll get to later in January. And in Luke chapter 22, and verse 70, during Jesus' closing arguments with the Sanhedrin, they asked, are you the Son of God then? And he said to them, Yes, I am. So Jesus does claim to be the Son of God, although he uses the title Son of Man far more often. Why? Well, to understand that appellation, we might need to run to Ezekiel to see how God uses it. But for now, let's focus on John 5, verses 25 through 29. There Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. And he gave him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth. Those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. It seems that the fact that He is the Son of God will be seen in His ability to provide life. There will be no denying it, even if some denied it then, have continued to deny it throughout history, and will continue to do so until the very end when every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Philippians 2, verses 10 through 11. You see it in His miracles. John chapter 20, verses 30 through 31 tell us that this is why John wrote, Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of His disciples, which are not written in this book. And in John chapter 21, verse 25, to close out His book, He says, And there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books that would be written. Continuing on in John chapter 20, But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. History shows us, though, that one of the first divergences from inspired apostolic doctrine, and we see it starting to be addressed in the later letters, is questioning the humanity of Jesus. And notice what Jesus says about this. He can execute judgment because He is the Son of Man. He has been tempted in all things, yet without sin, Hebrews 4, verse 15. He has authority on earth to forgive sins, Mark chapter 2 and verse 10. He is also able to send, quote, those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. 
So perhaps Jesus is showing those who heard, who touched, and who handled him that this is going to be the problem. Seeing Jesus as the Son of God is easy, but seeing him as the Son of Man is not. In any case, Mark affirms that great confession in the very first words he wrote, and now he begins to prove his assertion. Mark 1, verses 2 and 3. Prophecies Concerning the Herald Mark begins by looking not at Jesus, but at John the baptizer. And why is he important? Because of the prophecies from Malachi and Isaiah that Mark quotes. Now, Mark only cites Isaiah, but, number one, words were more expensive in those days, so you needed to be a little more economical in your writing. And two, a writer could depend on his reader's cultural knowledge to fill in some of the gaps. The quotation of Malachi is important because he is the prophet that closes out the Old Testament canon. He is the prophet who begins the 400 years of divine silence. And then suddenly, along comes John the baptizer to fulfill the prophecy given to Malachi. Another important point is about the prophecy itself. Malachi's audience didn't quite understand how they had offended God. Several times Malachi wrote, You have, and insert the offense here, yet you say, How? How have we? And then he shows them. For instance, just before the verse quoted in Mark, Malachi wrote, You have wearied the Lord with your words. Yet you say, How have we wearied him? In that you say, Everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Or, Where is the God of justice? Malachi 2, verse 17. Malachi says, God is tired of, quote, Those who call evil good and good evil, looking to Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20. As well as those who ask, Where is he? The Lord answers that question by saying, I'm coming, and you'll know because of, quote, my messenger, Malachi 3 and verse 1. The context of Isaiah's prophecy quoted in the beginning of Mark is at least as interesting as that in Malachi. After God had kept the Assyrian army at bay, that's an understatement, King Hezekiah of Judah was miraculously healed of some deadly sickness. Then the king of an historic nation heard about the miracle and sent some people to see how his counterpart was doing. Hezekiah showed the ambassadors how well off, how wealthy he was, and Isaiah told him, that's going to come back to bite us later. Hezekiah's response was, the word of the Lord which you have spoken is good, and then Isaiah gives us, by inspiration, the thoughts behind that statement. For he thought, for there will be peace and truth in my days, Isaiah 39 verse 8. It appears from the preceding verses, verses 6 and 7, that Hezekiah didn't really care about his son's kingdom. But while the king didn't care about the future, only about what was going on in his life, God offers comfort to his people in Isaiah chapter 40, which included in verse 3, a voice is calling, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Mark chapter 1, verses 4 through 13, the baptism of the herald. John was different. He was probably as out of place then as he would be today, but people liked to listen to him, even powerful people like Herod. Yes, probably just as a jester, but he enjoyed listening to him. We could talk about his home, we could talk about his clothing, we could talk about his diet, but the emphasis of Mark and the evangelists in general is on his teaching, and that was different too. John appeared preaching a baptism, Mark 1 verse 4. It was a baptism of repentance. It was a baptism that accompanied the mindset of those who sought it, a mindset of repentance. They had changed their mind about their sins. They confessed them, said they would no longer depend on them, and were immersed in the water of the River Jordan so that they would be forgiven. But John knew that he was not the one they were to be looking for. He was just announcing the coming of the hope of Israel. John was preparing the way so that the Messiah could get right to work. He was leveling the terrain so that people could see the Christ approach from miles away. John said that he wasn't even worthy to untie the shoes of the Christ. He was preparing the way of the Lord to baptize not with water, but in the Holy Spirit. And I want you to take note of the emphasized preposition there. You see, Mark has a Greek preposition before Holy Spirit, but not before water. Try as they might, many will say that immersion in water is unnecessary because of this and other verses, that John baptized with water, but Jesus is not baptizing with water. That's the claim. But those people fail to show the 
lack of importance in other verses that mention baptism in the Holy Spirit clearly involving water. The idea might be that John's baptism, being a precursor, was a model, but missing something. Immediately, something unexpected happened. The one whose shoelaces John was not worthy to untie came to him to be baptized. The one who didn't need a penitent baptism did it, quote, to fulfill all righteousness, Matthew 3, verse 15. And as soon as Jesus was baptized, the Father confessed that Jesus was his son. Look at what baptism does. It kind of reminds me of the story of Abraham preparing to offer Isaac. As Abraham is about to plunge the knife into his beloved son, God stops him and says, For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Genesis 22, verse 12. God knew of Abraham's fear and faithfulness, and the father knew of the sons as well. But in fulfilling all righteousness, the father can claim to be well-pleased in the son. Why did he need to say that? Why did Jesus need to hear it? He was about to be tempted, and Mark doesn't go into any detail, so we'll save this discussion for when we study a different account. Mark 1, verses 14 through 22, the teaching of the Christ. John was then taken into custody, which Mark will write about later. Now, John had said in John chapter 3 and verse 30, He must increase, but I must decrease. So Jesus takes up the message that John had been preaching, and only rightfully so because it was his message after all. John was only the forerunner, the herald, the messenger that would prepare the way for the Lord he represented, the Christ. So Jesus preached, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. There were some who would be commanded to follow him, common men who would be given an uncommon job. They were doing what any man would be doing, providing for their family in gainful employment, supporting their fathers in the family business. On the surface, they were no different than any other man of the time. But God does not look at the outward appearance, but at the heart. And so the Lord chose them to become not just fishermen, but fishers of men. They believed in Jesus and in his gospel. So when he said, follow me, they did, and they left everything to do so. Jesus was an amazing teacher, but more than that, he was an authoritative teacher. He didn't depend on what other people had said before him. He didn't need to cite his sources. He was the source. Sometimes we get too stressed out about proving the path to our point. But I think it's in those times that we need to follow our Lord's example And just speak the truth and say, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Mark chapter 1, verses 23 through 28. His authority displayed. Here we have the first of Jesus' miracles recorded in Mark. It involves a man with an unclean spirit. And I want you to take note of the three statements that that spirit makes. Number one. What to us and to you, and I know that is a wooden translation of what Mark writes, but it's what he said. More on that in a little bit. Two, have you come to destroy us? Or, you have come to destroy us. And three, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. The first statement is interesting to me because there is a similar instance of it in John chapter 2. When Mary tells Jesus that a wedding feast had run out of wine, Jesus responds, Who to me and to you? And again, I translated it woodenly word for word, but to make the point that this is an interesting question throughout not just the New Testament, but we're going to look at a couple of Old Testament examples as well. Similar to this instance is a question in Genesis chapter 23 and verse 15. After Sarah had died, Ephron and his family had offered Abraham a place to bury her. When Abraham tried to pay for it, Ephron responded, What is a piece of land worth 400 shekels of silver? between me and you. And we might paraphrase this. This ain't nothing. This is nothing between friends. I wonder if this is how Jesus meant it in Cana. Other examples of the question come from the Old Testament, the Septuagint in particular, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. I wonder how close the Hebrew is. And I'd say they are more apropos to our understanding the unclean spirit. In Judges 11 and verse 12, Jephthah asks the Ammonite king why he is fighting against the land of Israel. The Ammonites said it was a dispute about control. In 2 Chronicles 35, verse 21, the Egyptian king, Necho, uses the question to tell Josiah that his fight is not with him and to stay out of his way. 
The Spirit is requesting Jesus, leave us alone. The second statement could either be an interrogative or an indicative, a question or a direct statement. Have you come to destroy us? Is how it's often translated. But it could also be an indicative. You have come to destroy us. Perhaps even an exclamation. The Spirit is continuing their plea for Jesus to leave them alone. They recognize their judgment has come, and that is really the point. But why are they to be judged? Because they recognized who Jesus is and failed to follow through with that knowledge. And that's really in the third statement, which is too closely related to the second to warrant a separate paragraph. The key thing to remember, though, is this. Jesus' goal is to show himself to be the Son of Man. He wants to demonstrate his authority to judge. Even though he didn't come to judge the world but to save it, he can't do the latter without showing he can do the former. Yes, he came to save us. From what? He came to save us from the oppression of sin. But who can judge what sin is? Only God can. And Jesus is God. Again, I say it's easy to recognize that Jesus is the Son of God. So many people will quickly recognize the power, the inspiration of Jesus' teaching. But the question is, what do you do with that knowledge? Obeying Jesus is easy, even compulsory. You cannot fight against the laws of nature. But the question is, do you obey him reluctantly and receive the consequences of your sins? Or do you obey the Lord willingly? Ye must be born again, again. Ye must be born again, again. I verily, verily say unto thee, We invite you to join us as we worship our Lord and study His Word each Sunday morning at 9.15 a.m. for Bible classes for all ages, 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. for two distinct worship services, and each Wednesday evening at 6.30 p.m. for another chance to study and discuss God's Word. Occasionally, we may alter the p.m. service times for a special event. Please check palmyrachurchofchrist.org or our Facebook page for the schedule for the week. If you have any questions or would like to have a Bible study in person or by correspondence, email preacher at palmyrachurchofchrist.org or call 812-364-6215. Thank you for listening.